Hi everyone, it's Kelvin Hoy, the cinephile. Thank you so much for watching. I'm so glad to be back. Uh, so, a lot is happening in the world <laughs> right now, um, as you might know, but I wanted to do a video to help you guys out, to help myself out. Uh, hopefully this is fun for you, and hopefully it's fun for me. And I've been thinking about this uh, list for a long time now. So what I wanted to do today, uh, in light of the coronavirus and everything that's happening in the world, is talk about film, of course. But I want to talk about the best films of the decade. So from 2010 to 2019. That's 10 years of film. So I decided to do 25 films in total because, I mean, even the top 10 films of one year is difficult, so I knew I had to double that for 10 years. And I thought 25 was a cool number. It's just a I don't know, I just like that number. Um, 30 is a bit much, 20 is difficult. 20 would, yeah, I could do 20, but that's pretty difficult. And I also didn't want, I didn't want to do 50 or 100 <laughs> because <laughs> this list took three months. Uh, so 100 would have taken me a year or two years and I don't have that much time or have that much effort, uh, even though I love film. And I love talking to you guys. So let's get to it. So I'm going to say possibly two, three sentences about each film, uh, spend less than a minute on each one, hopefully, and unless I really love it, you know, the top 10. And yes, we'll go from there and hopefully this video won't be an hour long. Okay. All right. Here we go. So number 25 on my list of the top 25 films of the decade, of the past decade, is 1917. Um, I really liked 1917. I think it's a very good war film in the sense that it really boils it down to these two individuals, right? These two men on a mission. And some people might not like that. They want the battles and whatnot. But I think this really captures the horror of war. Um, you know, I watched it in theaters uh, with my wife. It was quite a harrowing experience, just, I mean, just watching it in theaters, uh, not even obviously being a part of a war uh, or battle. Um, so I thought it was harrowing, I thought it was well done. Uh, I know it's not one shot, but it looks like one shot for the film, which is really difficult. So they have these 10, 15 minute sequences where they just have it all planned out and they're filming and it's really well done, it's really well executed, um, I don't want to babble here, but it was, I think it's a really good war film, and I just sort of slotted this in uh, a couple of hours ago, I had Dunkirk on here for two months, over two months, but um, I think I like 1917 more, it's a little bit more straightforward, um, even though I know it's sort of sneaky in the way they film it. But uh, yes, watch 1917. It's a it's a really visceral experience, and I I think as time goes on, you know, people uh, people say oh horror is very visceral, right? Uh, the, those genre of horror, and I think from what I've seen, um, there's a film that we'll get to. That's my number two. Uh, that's visceral. 1917 is visceral as well. So. Um, I think it's interesting that we have different films that have that sort of, uh, you know, makes you a little bit nervous, makes you sweat a little bit, but it's not horror. Okay, that was way too long. Sorry, I apologize for that. Um, number 24 is John Wick. Great action film. Um, really impressive stunts, uh, stunts, stunt work, uh, fight choreography. Keanu is very good in it, I think. Um, and yeah, I watched that at home, didn't, totally missed it, completely missed it in theaters, but I, obviously word of mouth and I heard about it and I was like, oh, okay, I'll, I'll give it a try. My wife suggested it to me because she likes, um, she likes those type of films. She likes violence. Um, so we watched it. Uh, it's very good. I think it's my favorite one probably in terms of story. Like, I just like, I know some people think it's a little simple, a little too simple, but I like that it's simple, it's one story, and if they ended it there, that would have been cool. Um, I like John Wick 2 as well. Um, I think John Wick 3 is a little, <laughs> it's a little silly. But anyways, John Wick, great action film. 
uh, again, visceral, um, very uh, exciting to watch. Uh, it's well done, even though they had a smaller budget for the first film. But um, yeah, I think it's excellent. And it's one of the best of the decade and started this whole trilogy. And it's uh, really, you know, quite honestly, revived Keanu Reeves' career because he was doing, he was in quite a you know, quite a number of films, you know, a new film every year or every two years, but none were hitting uh, until John Wick. So, good for him, you know. I'm sure he's a hard worker and I haven't heard anything bad. <laughs> okay, number 23 is Black Swan. Um, when I was going through the list, you know, I, I looked at uh, Metacritic's top 10 films of the decade, you know, critics did uh, either top 10, top 15, top 20 um, films of the decade, which is really difficult because they watch, they've seen over a thousand films in that time and I've seen, I don't know if I've seen 500, um, probably just a few hundred. Um, but anyways, uh, Black Swan, I didn't see Black Swan on many people's lists, maybe one or two, and I think it deserves a little bit of recognition. Um, I think it's uh, Aronofsky, so he directed The Wrestler as well, um, which is good. Um, but Black Swan is is a little bit more different, a little bit more different, a little yeah, a little bit more different, um, a little bit stranger, a little bit again visceral. Um, you know, makes your skin crawl a little bit. Uh, I think yeah, and Natalie Portman does deliver an Academy Award worthy performance. Um, I don't know if she should have won, but she do, it's a very good performance and I think, you know, that's from 2010, that's probably, I remember watching with my sister in theaters and that was probably one of the better theatrical, not theatrical, um, movie going or cinematic experiences that I've ever had. Um, it's it's a very good film. I like that it's twisty, and I know some people think it's a little bit, I don't know, maybe it's a bit too, it's overrated or something like that, but I think it's very good, and it's an it's excellent performance from Portman, and uh, the rest of the cast is good too, but she's the star. She's the, she's the one who deserves all the accolades. Okay, so moving on. Number, I can't count, 25, 24, 23, 22. Number 22, The Grand Budapest Hotel. So I really liked this film. Uh, I don't think it's as good as people think it is, but it's, it's funny, it's charming, it's very Wes Anderson, you know, I don't know what that means. It's, um, I guess, a sort of indie, sort of, I don't know if hipster is the right word, but it's, no, I don't think so. It's a little bit, yeah, indie, a little bit independent, um, gets all these great actors, Willem Dafoe, Jude Law, um, I can't remember the, uh, I can't pronounce her name, Ronan, Cersei? Cersei Ronan? Yeah. Cersei? Cersei. Cersei Ronan, sorry about that. <laughs> she's like, she's been, she's been nominated for like four Academy Awards. Um, but yeah, I think it's a funny film, it's classy, even though it's really not classy, you know, when I was watching I was like, this really isn't classy, um, it's just not for teenagers, if that makes sense, um, unless a teenager is really mature, but yeah, I think it's a good film, um, I really enjoyed it, I know it's very high up on people's lists, um, a little bit lower on my list, but that's okay, yeah, again, it's not my favorites of all time, uh, but I really enjoyed it, I, and that was, I believe that's the first Wes Anderson film I've seen, which is sort of a crime. I should watch um, Rushmore and I uh, can't remember the other one, but um, yeah, Rushmore. Okay, Life, The Life Aquatic of Steve Zizou. Um, and there's another one I'm missing. I'll have to look it up. Okay, sorry about that. Okay, so number one, two, three. This is number 21. So number 21 is The Revenant with Leonardo DiCaprio, directed by Alejandro... 
Alejandro, R I can't pronounce his last name. Rurutu? Rurutu? Anyway, sorry about that. But The Revenant, uh, again, a very intense experience. Um, I really enjoyed it. I liked... Uh, I liked the cinematography, I liked the direction, I, I liked the story. I've actually read uh, the Hugh Glass story. Uh, you know, and not just the Wikipedia page, I actually read an article that was like 10 pages long. Um, one time, uh, when my wife was getting her ears pierced, I read the entire article. It was like over half an hour of my time. Um, but yeah, it's a really interesting story. Um, you know, obviously a little bit, you know, a little bit Hollywood, you know, the hero was, was Leonardo DiCaprio, even though he has a beard and his hair is all uh, unwashed and dirty and whatnot. But um, yeah, it's really, it's really good. I think it's, I don't think it's Leo's best performance, even though he won for that. Um, but it's a very good performance. I haven't seen it since. I've only watched it once in theaters because it's not the happiest of films. But um, yeah, it's very... I keep using that word. I'm trying to think of other words. Um, very intense. It's an experience. Um, you know, cinematic experience that you have to watch on the big screen. And I really... I really enjoy what's saying about nature as well and man's greed and whatnot. So, yeah, that's why it's on this list. Okay. So, number 20. Oh, I have Mission Impossible Ghost Protocol. So, Mission Impossible Ghost Protocol, I think it's the best Mission Impossible film, to be honest. Like, it blew me away when I watched it. Um, when I watched it, pardon me. Um, because I think I saw the trailer, I must have seen it, and I was like, oh, that looks good. And I liked, I've seen, I haven't watched the original Mission Impossible, which is, I know, it's ridiculous. Um, so I watched 2, 3, and I was like, oh, they sort of took a little break after 3 because it didn't make as much money. And it wasn't, maybe, I think it was, I think critically it did okay. But, um, you know, it didn't make as much money, and Tom Cruise was, you know, <laughs> having his issues. But I still think he's a great action star. Uh, he's a good actor. He doesn't get enough credit for his acting ability. Um, and yeah, it's, it's all on display in Mission Impossible Ghost Protocol. I think it has the best stunt in the entire Mission Impossible series. He's hanging off of that huge building. Um, oh my gosh, I can't remember anything today. Pardon me. But he's, you know, hanging off of the huge building with a glove and it's you know, the red and the blue, it's just so great. Like, it's such an entertaining film, and it really impressed me. It blew me away. Um, so, yeah, that's why it's here. I think it's... I know they're just incredible stunts for uh, Fallout as well, and um, Rogue Nation. But for me, for my taste, you know, just everything. The cinematography, the aesthetic, um, the emotion. I really love growth. Ghost Protocol. Um, I don't know. That's my favorite. Okay. So we have 25, 24, 23, 22, 21, 20, 19. 19. 21 Jump Street. Um, so might surprise some people, but I really enjoyed 21 Jump Street. Uh, I think it's probably one of the better comedies of the entire decade. I know some people think uh, Bridesmaids. But for me, it doesn't have that, I know that's sort of, I don't know if it's Apatow, but Apatow style, I haven't watched enough Apatows to, to be perfectly honest, but that's sort of like, oh, let's just repeat the same joke over and over again. Let's keep going, let's keep going. And that's sort of funny in a way. Um, I understand some people like that, but for me, 21 Jump Street, that's where we have, um, where we found the directors, not found them, but where we first introduced to the, to the directors, Lord and Miller. They directed uh, another film, which is on my list. I'll get to that. Um, but 21 Jump Street, uh, it's good, rated R, fun. Um, yeah, it's really hilarious. The story's pretty good. And it's, you know, it's... And these directors, I mean, they just take bad ideas and make good films out of them. You know, I mean, a remake, a cinematic version, a film version of a television show, 21 Jump Street. I mean... It could have been awful, 
uh, with Channing Tatum, who's not known for comedy before this, but he did well. Uh, Jonah Hill's funny, and yeah, the story's decent, and it's well done. So, and the acting's okay and all that. So I think it's, I think it's a very good comedy. Okay, and now we are number 18, Blackfish. I'm really surprised that I didn't see this on anyone's list for the best film, uh, or a best film of the decade. I think Blackfish, Blackfish, pardon me, is disturbing. It is horrible to watch. Uh, it's fascinating um, because you think, you know, as a kid, as a child, you think, oh, it's sort of awful that these animals are in a zoo. I mean, there's some bright children out there. And so as, you know, and myself as well, uh, maybe closer to my teen years, I started thinking that, uh, not when I was five. But, um, you know, you think that and you think, oh, it's sort of terrible that they're in here. And then, you know, zoo might make excuses and say, oh, these, well, you know, they're injured or they were, you know, we can't put them back in the wild now. It's too, you know, they've been in the zoo for five years, six years, seven years. Like, putting them in the wild is just killing them, which is true. I understand that. Um, but the issue is that these zoos should not have existed in the first place. And I know SeaWorld uh, is not a zoo, uh, per se, but it's an amusement park uh, more. Uh, more of an amusement park, but it's, I mean, Blackfish really opened my eyes to that, and it, it's probably one of the only documentaries, I mean, you know, there's Bowling for Columbine in the 2000s, which I don't, I don't think it actually affected any change, uh, and people say, well, SeaWorld still exists, but yeah, Blackfish opened everyone's eyes and put pressure on them, and they said, well, we're not, we're not going to have any more births, you know, we're not going to, and of course they're going to steal more orcas from the wild uh, and dolphins, which is horrible. Um, but I don't, I don't want to get, you know, too emotional here. Um, but yeah, I mean, Blackfish really, I saw it just flipping through the channels. I think I, I missed the first couple of minutes, but I watched all of it and I caught the uh, couple of minutes uh, afterwards uh, because they were replaying it. Uh, I think they replayed it three times. Uh, I think it was a CNN film, so they're playing it on that channel. But yeah, it's one of the most disturbing documentaries I've ever seen, and uh, I know some of you might be saying you need to watch more documentaries. Um, there's also another one about um, uh, not female prostitution, um, young girls being sold into prostitution. Um, I can't remember the name, that one's really disturbing as well. But for this decade, Blackfish, I think it's, it's affected the world, it actually made a difference. Um, I can't watch, I know people are saying The Cove, uh, I can't watch The Cove, um, <laughs> which makes me cry, but uh, I, I will watch it eventually, and I don't, I'm not sure if it's in the 2010s. But yeah, for me, for my money, Blackfish, watch it if you haven't, it's an important documentary. Um, I know people are still fighting SeaWorld, and because it's a corporation, it's not going to be easy, but hopefully it's 2020 as I'm filming this, as you're watching this, so hopefully good things happen and we, we stop, you know, we stop. Um, I know it's really difficult, zoos still exist, but hopefully in the next five years, ten years, these things will be eliminated. Okay, uh, that was number 18. Number 17 is Star Wars The Force Awakens. So, I think, again, you know, I've been trying to change, I've tried to choose films that are important, and then films that I just love, um, and I really, really like uh, Star Wars The Force Awakens, I mean, there's maybe like one little scene that's, you know, silly, <laughs> stupid, but uh, stupid is a better word, um, but yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's a great film, I think it was clean, you know, compared to The Last Jedi, and so as I was saying, I think The Force Awakens is the cleanest one of the new trilogy, uh, the sequel trilogy, and so many people were looking forward to it, episode 7, 8, 9, um, I know it didn't turn out perfectly, um, I really enjoy 7, so I think Seven's the cleanest, I think they didn't have any baggage, um, I know the prequels, they did have baggage, but it was, it was, 
Yes, between release dates, it was over 10 years uh, between release dates. Because I believe Revenge of the Sith came out in May 2005 and Force Awakens came out in December 2015. So it was a 10-year gap. Um, so all of the baggage from the prequel trilogy, I mean, it was still there, but I think it was gone, whereas I think The Last Jedi was so divisive, Rise of Skywalker's divisive as well. So I think Force Awakens um, is the cleanest one. I think it's arguably the best one um, of the sequel trilogy. I, I think J.J. Abrams did a good job, I mean, introducing new characters, Rey, Kylo, um, Finn, obviously Poe, that people cared about. I mean, almost immediately, right? They watched the film, they enjoyed it. You have, it made $900 million domestically, over $900 million, uh, And it sort of brought Star Wars back, basically. Because after Revenge of the Sith, I think, starting in 2006, it started, Star Wars starting to fade away. I know Clone Wars, with, um, uh, I say Clone Wars because it's on Disney Plus now, kept Star Wars alive for children, but I think... And adults, some adults, um, but I think it started to fade Star Wars from the consciousness a little bit. And I think Force Awakens is such a difficult film to create. It's sort of like not The Phantom Menace because The Phantom Menace had even more expectations and that was a longer period. I think it was 16 years, 15 years. Uh, I think it was 16 years. Um, but anyways. I thought J.J. Abrams did a good job, introduced us Daisy, uh, Daisy Ridley, who did a good job. Um, Adam Driver obviously cemented his career a little bit more. Uh, I think he would have done well regardless. But uh, yeah, so that's my one of my picks for Best of the Decade. Okay, where are we here? So... Okay, I'm going to put a number here, so I am not lost anymore. Okay, number 16 is Creed. Creed blew me away. It's one of those films that blew me away. Um, did not watch it in theaters, watched it at home. Heard it was incredible. I watched it. I can confirm that. It's an incredible film. Uh, obviously, a couple of scenes here and there that aren't to my liking, uh, that are not perfect, you know, I'm not saying it's a perfect film, um, I think it's a little bit, you know, maybe, because it's sort of like a, you know, one of these legacy sequels, right, it sort of takes place, you know, many years later, like The Force Awakens, and it's sort of, you know, you bring back, obviously, Sylvester Stallone, um, but it's a new story, um, so I think Creed, Creed does a, maybe even does a better job than Force Awakens because a lot of people say Force Awakens is just a new hope with new characters, basically. Uh, even though it's a little bit different, uh, I think. But um, Creed sort of uses Rocky, uses Sylvester Stallone's character very well, uh, incorporates him very well. Uh, obviously, if you haven't seen it, watch it. Um, there's a couple of incredible sequences in the film, and yeah, it's well done, again, it's well directed, uh, Ryan Coogler directed it, um, I think the acting's good, Michael B. Jordan's great in it, uh, Stallone's good in it, so yes, check it out if you haven't. Okay, so number 15 is The Hunger Games, Catching Fire. So, Again, this film sticks out in my mind as one of the better sequels of the past decade. Like, this film, maybe not as much as some of the other films on this list, but it did impress me. I'll say that. Uh, it did impress me because it's a sequel. I know the first sequel, sort of that second film in a trilogy, or second film in a uh, quadri quadrilogy, you know, four films now. <laughs> with Harry Potter and, uh, not Harry Potter, sorry, uh, The Hunger Games, obviously. Um, but, you know, splitting that, splitting that last book into two films, which um, I did watch. <laughs> I watched all of them, but um, I think 
Catching Fire, again, it's relatively clean. It, I hate the second book. I, I stopped watching. I stopped watching. I stopped reading the books, uh, the novels, after the second one. I really enjoyed the first one. I thought it was, even though I think uh, the idea wasn't the most original, I think uh, some uh, Japanese director or Japanese writer had that idea first, you know, five, ten years before Hunger Games even existed. But anyways, um, I do like the story. Uh, I think Jennifer Lawrence gives a good performance. I think everyone's good in the film. They improve the film. I think the second half is rocking, you know, and which is true to the book as well. The first half is very uh, slow. But um, I think they sort of maybe cut out a little bit of the first half of the second book, which really worked. With I mean, they had to as well, but it worked better for the flow and for the structure of the film. And uh, I haven't seen it since, but I think the emotion, I mean, I remember feeling, uh, you know, touch. The emotion in the film is good. Uh, Lawrence is good. I already said that. Sorry. But yeah, I just think it's one of the better sequels of the past decade. And again, I didn't see it on anyone's list, so I'm putting it on my list, okay? Uh, I think it's a good film. And, I mean, The Hunger Games was a good film too, but I think the first Hunger Games was a little slow, maybe a little bit... Didn't quite have the budget, looked a little bit cheap in places, and, you know, obviously Catching Fire, they spent a little bit more on it, so it looks a little bit better. Okay. Number 14, Inception. All the way from 2010. So I have a couple of 2010 picks here, Black Swan. Uh, Inception, I think Blackfish is from 2011. Um, Inception is really impressive. I'm glad I kept this on here because I got rid of Dunkirk. <laughs> but it's it's one of those films that's changed the world, you know, in a very small way. Uh, I think changed cinema, uh, and Christopher Nolan did that. Um, again, DiCaprio gives great performance. I don't know, I don't want to say his performance is better here. I think Revenant's a little bit more extreme. Uh, but, and we were introduced to Tom, or I was introduced to uh, Tom Hardy in Inception. Uh, Joseph Gordon Levitt is okay in this, he's good. Um, Ken Watanabe is good. Ellen Page is good. So, Michael Caine. So, the acting across the board is good, the story is good. I think the execution is a little, it's a little bit long. Uh, it's not the shortest film. I remember feeling a little bit long to me. Um, I think the emotions not quite there, you know, because you just sort of see things happen. You don't really have any connection to the characters. Um, you know, Cobb, obviously, um, Leo's character and his wife uh, Marion Cotillard is good as well. Um, but yeah, I think in terms of originality. Uh, I know some people have said, well, it's not that original, you know, Dreams. Uh, but the way it's done, you know, even the title, right, Inception. Uh, you know, because sort of like, it has to do with Dreams, but sort of, uh, what's it called? Oh my goodness, it's not a crime film, but it's sort of a, um, a heist film, which is really cool. So you have a little bit of action. Uh, I think it could have used a little bit more, to be honest. And they have the spinning, really iconic, that sort of spinning, uh, spinning action sequence where they're sort of, you know, jumping on the walls, uh, which is really cool. I just saw, I just saw a clip of that actually recently. Okay, so now we are at another, <laughs> oh man, I think my uh, love for Leo is showing here. Too much, I apologize. But number 13 is a Scorsese film. It is The Wolf of Wall Street, I think. Again, this is a really long, it's three hours, I believe, um, three hours and one minute, uh, or just three hours, you know, right before three hours, um, two hours and 59 minutes, maybe. But uh, yes, it is a long film, but it doesn't feel too long. I think maybe there's like one or two sequences where it's sort of like, okay, like, you know, you can, you should, you could have trimmed this a little bit, but um, it's Scorsese. <laughs> So he does a great job telling the story about greed, American greed, uh, more specifically. Leo gives a great performance, again, iconic. I think this is probably the most iconic, iconic performance of the decade for him. Uh, maybe Inception, 
But I think in terms of society, it actually affected society because people are, and, and McConaughey as well, right? People are like beating their chests, uh, you know, for the several months, maybe even a year after this film, you know, was released. And I remember watching, I didn't watch it in theaters for some reason, I don't know why, but um, maybe I thought it was too, you know, I was rated R and people were saying it's insane. And I watched it at home and I was like, yeah, it is, but it's not too bad. It's not like the most violent film or the most, um, the most, I can't, uh, sexual, I don't even know what the word is, the most uh, graphic film of all time. It's not. I think it's, it's done pretty well. Um, it tells a story and it tells... You know the insane things that this man did, uh, Jordan Belfort. But I don't think it really, you know, languishes on you know shots like oh let's get more like more nude women nude women you know what I mean it's I mean there is that because but it's very it's very dialogue driven. There's lots of um, uh, dialogue scenes, lots of good acting scenes, opportunities for Leo. Um, oh my goodness, this guy's on my list three times as well, uh, <laughs> what's his name, oh my gosh, um, oh my goodness, okay, I have to look it up, I'm sorry, because I have to tell you, he's on my list three times, uh, Jordan, um, oh my goodness, it's, uh, uh I'm just filming this at night and I can't remember, Jonah Hill, sorry, Jordan, oh my gosh, Sorry about that. Jonah Hill is on this list three times. I didn't even re realize that until a moment ago. Okay. So, anyways. Uh, yes, The Wolf of Wall Street is number 13. I really enjoyed it. Uh, I think it's, again, excellent performance uh, from Leo, McConaughey, everyone, Jonah Hill. Uh, Margot Robbie. The world was introduced to Margot Robbie. I think I was introduced to her. That was her big break, though. I was introduced to her on the Pan Am which was a television show that was canceled after one season, um, which is too bad. But hey, she moved on to bigger and better things. Okay, so number 13 is The Wolf of Wall Street. Number 12 is How to Train Your Dragon. Um, I, don't, I don't think I saw this on anyone's list. Um, and what I'm talking about is Metacritic has, they collect this list of like 50 critics did you know, 50, 55 critics did um, top 10 films or top 20 films of the decade, which is difficult to do, so not everyone did it. But um, I don't know, I think this was mentioned once maybe or twice, but it's How to Train Your Dragon, that is number 12, and I think it's, I think it's a really touching film. Again, this, this one surprised me, I watched it at home, uh, heard good things, and I was like, really, really, <laughs> How to Train Your Dragon is good? And people were like, yes! And I was like, okay, I'll watch it. And I watched it with my family. Um, can't remember who else was there. Maybe my sister. Um, yes, my sister was there. But I can't remember who else. Um, and this was after... This this film came out in 2010 as well. So I have a, a, quite a number of 2010 films. So I must have seen it in 2011. And I really enjoyed it. Um, uh, the humor is mostly good. Maybe a couple of jokes are not so great uh and there's a lot of you know jonah hills in this oh my gosh i think he's on this list four times but um oh my gosh he needs to get out my brain um he did some good work um but yeah how to train dragon maybe just a little bit you know yelling you know for the children but uh it's a really touching film toothless is iconic now um it's a great trilogy as well i think I put number one because that it started it, and I think that's the best one. I think number two has some issues, maybe the villains a little... I think the villains villains for number two and three are a little bit boring. You know, slightly... I don't know, they're just not that interesting to me. So I think number one is the best one, where it's sort of the conflict between... At first, you know, the conflict between Hiccup and Toothless, and of course they become friends and best friends. and uh, it's, it's... yeah, it's a lovely film. Okay, so that was number 12. Number 11 is Toy Story 3. Um, I love Toy Story 3. I think the quadrilogy, the four Toy Story films, even though number four is really, 
showing its age. I think I mentioned this. I don't want to belabor the point. But, um, you know, as a whole, the four films, like, if you watch them, they're just... I can't think of any other four films that are that good. Maybe Harry Potter, um, the first four films are pretty good. <sighs> Hunger Games, no. <laughs> I mean, that's okay for four films. It's not bad, but I think in terms of excellence, I think it has to go to Toy Story. Uh, it's one of the greatest trilogies of all time. You add in... Because I think the third one, people argue, like, people think, you know... I, I mean, I would argue Toy Story 2 and Toy Story 3 are better than the first one. I think the first one, the animation's a little rough now, and I think the story... I mean, the story's great, but I think it's a little maybe small, and it's Toy Story 2 and 3 are bigger and better, for lack of a better phrase. But yeah, Toy Story 3, uh, 2010 again, it's excellent, it's funny, it's heartwarming, it's just... It was such a great end to Andy's story. I know Andy shows up in number four. Um, spoiler alert, it's in the first five minutes. But um, yeah, it's, it's great. I mean, it's a great story, and I, it's Woody's story, really, right? I mean, he is the main character for the four films, and I think even the trilogy, you could argue, is all, it's always from you know Woody's point of view. He doesn't take a back seat. Uh, in any of the films. Um, so yeah, but number three is beautiful. That ending, if you haven't seen it for some reason, it's glorious. You should watch Toy Story. All of them. Uh, but the first three, absolutely. Okay. And we have number ten. So number ten, wow, that's high. Number ten is Moneyball. Um, I think, I'm just going to check the time here. Okay, I have time. So, I think Moneyball is, it's excellent. Uh, I wasn't really expecting anything. Again, the film has heart, has a little bit of emotion. Um, I'm not a massive baseball person. I mean, I like, I like the four sports, um, baseball, basketball, I can't think right now, <laughs> soccer, and basketball, right? Those are the four main ones. And, you know, there are lots of other sports sports that I like, uh, badminton and tennis and whatnot. But those are the four main ones. So I do like baseball. I used to play a lot, a lot more. Uh, not so much, well, n none at all right now uh, or past five years. But um, I used to play a lot when I was a kid, uh, baseball, and I really enjoyed it. Um, but yeah, so and I haven't watched too many baseball films. I know there's some good ones out there. Uh, Field of Dreams, The Rookie, you know, other things like that, uh, other films like that. Uh, what's that? A League of Our Own, which I haven't seen all the way through. Like I've watched, I think, I think I watched like seventy five percent of it because it was on television all the time, and I always miss the first like 10, 15 minutes of that darn film. But anyways, um, Moneyball is excellent. Brad Pitt gives a great performance, uh, very good performance, and I think he's, yeah, he's. Maybe a little bit underrated. I think he's a little bit wooden at times. Depends on the film. Um, but he's really excellent as he gets older. And this is when he was 40, I believe, or 41. I can't remember. Uh, or 42, I can't remember. But anyways, so he's a little bit older. He has more experience. Um, but he's, he gives a good performance. <laughs> that darn Jonah Hill. I was about to swear. This darn Jonah Hill is in the film as well. I think he he won Best Supporting Actor, or he was nominated for Best Supporting Actor. That was his breakthrough into dramatic roles. Um, so he did a good job. I think. Every so as I was saying, great performances across the board for Moneyball. Now number nine, The Avengers. I love The Avengers. I love the MCU. I love the Marvel films. I think they're great. Um, I chose the Avengers because I think I only saw it once on those critics list and lists, pardon me, and uh, I think it deserves more credits. Uh, we wouldn't have Infinity War or Endgame without the original, the Avengers. And as much as I dislike him, um, because I think he's a overrated, a little bit overrated, and apparently he's a terrible human being, um, Joss Whedon did a great job with the Avengers. It has that. Uh, Whedon dialogue, uh, but it also has good action sequences, good special effects. You have 
you know, four, I mean, you have six characters coming together, but really four different franchises, potential franchises, which we all, uh, which they all became uh, individually and as a larger part uh, of the MCU, you know, within the larger MCU, I mean, um, you have Iron Man, Captain America, Hulk, and Thor, and then you have uh, Black Widow and Hawkeye, obviously, uh, two smaller characters at first, uh, and then they all came together in this, and that's never been done before. I mean, you had two characters crossing over, so there, there have been crossovers, but not, you know, four origin films building up to this, you know, huge event film. I think The Avengers was actually number six, because we had two Iron Man films. But yeah, I love The Avengers, I think it deserves to be on uh, top 10 or top 25 list or top 20 list for uh, the decade. It's uh, very entertaining, it's funny, uh, it's awesome seeing these characters you know, together for the very first time, so that's very memorable to me. Okay, so number 8 is Inside Out. Inside Out is beautiful, uh, it's so creative. Um, I remember they introduced this at D23, I think probably two years before it came out, or maybe it was uh, 18 months. But anyways, they introduced it, um, the Pixar film that takes you inside the mind. And that was it, that was the log line, and once I heard that, uh, I think they introduced Good Dinosaur and Inside Out. <laughs> yes, because they came out the same year. Um, and the Pixar film about dinosaurs, you know, those are just two such great headlines and two log lines, I mean. And obviously the good dinosaur is a little bit lower on the list, uh, on the totem pole, and Inside Out is near the top. I mean, I think it's in the top 10 Pixar films. Uh, it's beautiful, touching, it has that heart, um, has that Pixar charm. Uh, the animation is great, colorful. Um, I like how it's, you know, five different emotions. They, they kept the five instead of six or seven. I think it would have been too much. So it's very, it's very well done. Pete Docter is the director. He directed Up. He directed Monsters, Inc. Um, again, three great films. So he's, you know, batting a very high, uh, very high percentage right now. Uh, so Inside Out, yes. And the score is actually very good too by um, Michael G. Michael Giciano, I think it is. Giciano or Giciano? I can't pronounce it. Anyways, the score is good. Uh, the film's excellent. Okay, so that was number eight was Inside Out. Okay, number seven, there's going to be a lot of animation. Uh, Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. Uh, beautiful film. The animation's stunning. Uh, it's very clever, very well done, very well told, sort of to have this multiverse, you know, these different spider men and women or spider characters coming together. Um, it's told really well because I think that could be confusing to people and they might um, watch it and say, oh, that's that's strange. Like when I first heard about it, I was like, oh gosh, like this is Sony, like what are they gonna do with Spider-Man? They're gonna ruin him. Not ruin him, but like it's not gonna be good, right? It's gonna be sort of um, lame or confusing and it's it's not at all it's it's beautifully done it's uh has that heart uh a little bit of emotion uh i think there are funnier films but it's done really well and it's, uh lord and miller are part of uh spider verse as well they're producers on that um i can't remember if they wrote a draft i don't think so but anyways it's a beautiful film uh, so that is my number seven number six more animation the lego movie uh I put the Lego movie higher because I think the animation's good. Um, it's it's really interesting. I know sort of you know they're Lego, so maybe this it lends itself to animation. But I think again, what could have been a really terrible idea? It's super commercial, right? It's like so popular, like Lego. Uh, what could have been a terrible idea turns out really well. I think it's one of the best films of the past decade. It's clever. It's uh, well written. It's uh, well animated. The story's good. Um, so the Lego Movie, yeah. Uh, and I think 
everything is awesome is awesome <laughs> that song I think they use it really well and it's sort of um, I don't know if it's socialist or I don't know what the word would be I, I guess a dictatorship almost uh, and that uh, I haven't seen it in five years but uh, I, I watched it at home I missed that in theaters as well I missed the boat a little bit but um, I did watch it at home and it's yeah it's lovely it's a lovely film and it's really uh, colorful and playful and really clever and I think it's I think it's a little bit funnier than Spider-Verse to be honest so that's why it's my number six okay last animation it's pretty high number five is Moana um, I think Moana is beautiful uh, really touched me um, you know may or may not have made me cry in theaters uh, but yeah The Rock does a good job uh, can't pronounce her name, Uli. Uli Cavallo does a good job. Um, Lynn Manuel Lynn Manuel Miranda does a great job with the songs. I think it's the best musical that Disney has put out since probably The Lion King, I think. I think it's better than Mulan uh, music. I think it's better than Mulan, I think it's better than Hercules, uh, maybe Hercules, I'll say Hercules because Hercules has some really good songs, I, can't, I think Hercules only has three or four songs, but anyways, um, yeah, I'll say Hercules, because um, they have some, no, they have, they have a lot of music because of the muses, um, but they have some really good music in Hercules, um, so I'll say Hercules, but uh, Moana is beautiful, it's a great story, female-led um, uh, character-driven film. Uh, it's by Clements and Musker, who directed, in order, let me get this right, The Great Mouse Detective, which is one of my favorites, The Little Mermaid, Aladdin, which is glorious, um, Hercules, Princess and the Frog, Moana. Six films, together as a team. Six films, and they're all good, to varying degrees. That's pretty impressive. Um, so yeah, Moana is my number five. I think it's beautiful, beautiful story, uh, and it and it's not Hawaiian. It's sort of um, I don't want to say Pacific Islanders, but um, in that region, which is really cool. They haven't done that yet, and I think so. Moving on to number four on my list, it's Arrival. Uh, I think Arrival is super beautiful. Um, it really speaks to humanity to uh, humanity's capability for good, uh, of working together, of collaboration, of really, and when I say humanity, I mean, I don't mean like a large group of people, I mean humanity like <laughs> taking care of each other, which is really important during this virus. Um, helping each other, trying to figure something out. Um, yeah, Amy Adams gives a very good performance. Uh, Renner's good. Uh, again, it's one of those casts that everyone does a good job. The story is great. I don't want to ruin everything uh, in case you have not seen it. But yeah, just the way it's shot. Cinematography is beautiful. Um, it's a... Uh, Devenu, he um, he directed this. He directed Prisoners. He directed um, what's the other one? Blade Runner twenty forty nine. Uh, so I've watched three of his films, and I think Arrival is the best one. Um, I ha I've never seen Enemy. Um, I'll have to give that a try one day. But yeah, this one's really his. I mean, from those three films, I think it's his most sensitive. His most human film. Um, so yes, Arrival is number four on my list. It is beautiful. Check it out if you haven't. Um, and I didn't even watch a trailer for this. I, I saw the poster and I was like, oh, that looks interesting. <laughs> Odd. But I watched it and it's just, it's beautiful. Um, the message is really great. Okay, number three is Man of Steel. So, Man of Steel is one of my favorite films of all time. Uh, so it's going to make it onto a top 25 of the last decade. Um, I think it's... 
I don't know, it's really difficult, right? When you speak about that, it's like, you know, what are your top five films? What are your top ten films of all time? Like, no matter what. You know, it doesn't matter the genre. Um, just films in general. Um, I think Man of Steel might be in my top ten. Uh, I don't know. I just love it. I think it's... it's I mean, Superman is obviously <laughs> a very... A uh, good Superman film. I just I just watched that last year, uh, less than a year ago. I think it was ten months ago. Uh, it's the first time I ever watched Superman. Superman, pardon me, all the way through. I've seen, I think Superman, uh, Superman two, three, like on television, but bits and pieces. And that, I was never a huge Superman fan until Smallville. So that I was fourteen, I believe, when Smallville started. Um, fourteen, fifteen, maybe. Uh, 14 or 15, doesn't matter. And um, that's when I really got into Superman. I was like, oh, Smallville, this sounds idiotic. Like, this sounds stupid. What is this? And I actually watched it because my sister was watching it. And so I watched it and I was like, oh, it's so good. I love it. <laughs> I love it so much. I still love it. I love the first eight seasons because that's what I watched. The first seven seasons, sorry. I finished the first seven seasons. I tried finishing the eighth season. Didn't finish. Or did I? Yes, I did. I finished the first eight seasons. Sorry, so long ago. Uh, I watched the first five episodes, six episodes of season nine, and I, I couldn't do it anymore. I gave up. I, I never finished the series, um, but I, I do love Smallville very much. Uh, it really helped me during my high school years, um, <laughs> during those difficult times. But um, yeah, Man of Steel, I think it brings Superman, it brings Clark Kent into the 21st century, really. And it's it's necessary. I mean, you can't have. I mean, you can't have a character who who's you know walking around saying "gee whiz," you know, and um, you know, going like "oh," you know, every minute. It's it's. Yeah, I mean. I think. The Superman mythos has to change a little bit. I mean, they change it for Man of Steel. Uh, Lois, this is halfway through the film, uh, and it's it's pretty old now. It's seven years old. So, I mean, Lois knows who he is, um, and she should figure it out. And I think that's more of a general populist thing, right? Like Superman, if, if he comes in with different hair and he's wearing a suit, and you have a guy wearing, um, you know, a shirt and tie and glasses, you know, people are like, what? You know, is it? You know, I'm not sure. Like, th people don't know who Clark Kent is. He lives in a city, right? So. If Metropolis is New York City, and Gotham is Chicago, whatever, um, you know, examples you want to use uh, for those two cities, and then, yeah, I mean, I wouldn't know a Clark Kent who lived in New York City, right? Unless he was, you know, a family member's friend or a friend of a friend, right? I'd probably never meet him. So it works in that way. But, uh, yeah, anyways, I'm sorry, it's a long tangent. Um, Man of Steel is, I think it's a beautiful film. Uh, I think the action sequences blew me away. I've never seen anything like that before. Um, you know, and there are scenes in Man of Steel that I just watch over and over again. Like, um, like, um, what's it called? Uh, Superman versus Feora, Superman versus Zod, uh, the world engine scene, I think it's just beautiful like the visuals are so glorious like Snyder did such a good job I know people don't like Snyder a lot of people don't but he did such a good job and I think with Man of Steel he showed maturity I mean I know he was 40 when he directed it but it wasn't like this bro movie you know what I mean like 300 is very masculine and I think um, Man of Steel is you know it's masculine obviously Superman but there's it's really feminine as well because you have powerful female characters in different ways you know Lois Lane of course is always a um, uh, firecracker of a character and um, I think really it's just a really it's well told the visual effects are incredible the action sequences are incredible just some of the angles and shots that Snyder does I mean I would have never imagined that I love that the cape shot from you know from down here and just watching a cape flow in the wind. Um, there's another shot where Superman is flying out of the ship, you know, with his uh, cape again. It's just 
it's such a beautiful film and I, I really think it gets a little bit too much hate um, and and look uh, you know Superman does something very traumatic to him to the audience you know near the end of the film I could live without that you know I understand that I think the film actually if he figured out another way you know if he just got Zod into the Phantom Zone I think the film still works because that's just one literally it's a it's a one minute difference right like instead of what we have with Man of Steel you just shoot one minute of alternate footage and the film is almost the same right and you have the destruction but I think it works really well I think it makes sense and there's there's a boatload of destruction if you watch Justice League Unlimited or Justice League the animated show for um children there's a boatload of destruction in that so anyways it's beautiful i'm rambling about man of steel it's my number three number two is mad max fury road i think it's this is what i mean by visceral this is a visceral film it is action-packed uh it makes you sweat it makes you feel you know uh it you know gets your adrenaline pumping uh hardy is great charlie's theron is great um can't remember the other actor's name, but <laughs> he, Nicholas Holt is good. Um, yeah, it's, it's a great film. It's a great action film. It's a great... Uh, I know people think, or people, I've heard a couple of people say the plot is a bit thin. Um, I can't really argue with that, but it works. Like, there's enough there that they go on this adventure, on this, um, really this um, sort of road warrior film, and it's just so vicious and so you know you feel every punch and um i think and but it's a very light rated r like i i believe it is rated r but it's very light like if they cut out one second or two seconds of a shot you know of a scene i mean uh it could be a pg-13 like that's how it is i love all the orange um the cgi is seamless it's it's shots uh the stunts obviously and uh where it's shot i think it was uh somewhere in africa or morocco i'm not sure um yeah it's just really beautiful and really well done like the physical sets are glorious so that's my number two mad max fury road what is number one it is la la land um i think la la land is beautiful it touched me to my core um after we finished watching la la land i was walking out with my wife from the theater in vaughn i believe and i was dancing i was like dancing and like humming the music i mean it is a beautiful film um you know it reminds me a little bit of 500 days of 500 500 days of summer uh which is also one of my favorites um top 15, top 20, uh, but La La Land is my number one from the past decade, I think it's so beautiful, it's an original musical, It's re that's really difficult to do, I mean, you have, I think, I can't remember, maybe five or six original songs, they're all good, um, they found these two guys, geniuses who uh, worked on La La Land, uh, they did uh, uh, the song for Jasmine uh, in Aladdin. They did The Greatest Showman, which is one of the better musicals of all time for a musical um, because the songs and the sequences, the dance sequences are so good. Um, but yeah, La La Land uh, has the hearts. Uh, Ryan Gosling's great. Emma Stone is fantastic. Um, they have good chemistry. Uh, I think, you know, that maybe a couple of the jokes land flat for me um you know it's not the funniest film of all time but i think it's really good and it deserves to be number one everywhere uh i was really surprised that it was i don't think it was in top five of those you know uh, metacritic the list they collected all the points from these um these critics lists and there was like social network which isn't on my list um it's number three and mad max fury road is number one and Moonlight's number two, and I I don't think La La Land's in the top five, which is really surprising to me. I love La La Land, um, and I've watched uh, A Lovely Night. I've watched that sequence I think fifty times, <laughs> and it's like six minutes long each time. 
Uh, but anyways, La La Land is my number one. Thank you so much for watching. I know this was very incredibly long. Uh, I apologize for that. <sighs> I try not to do it, but I just can't help myself. Um, subscribe. Tell a friend. Send this to a friend. Get the word out about the cinephile. I love making videos for you guys. Um, uh, it's really fun. It's a little bit of work, uh, but it's a lot of fun. And I love talking about films, and I love talking to you guys. And I've gotten some very nice comments. So, yes, please subscribe. Tell a friend. Send this to a friend. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for watching this. Um, stay safe. Stay healthy. And hopefully I will do another video soon when all of this is over. This damn virus is over. Um, yes. Thank you so much. Bye for now.